Hello, everyone. Welcome to another great episode of Talks at Google. We have a really special guest here today, Mr. Tom Russo. He needs no introduction. Mr. Tom Russo of Gardner Russo & Gardner uh, is an exceptional value investor. He graduated from Dartmouth College with a degree in history and Stanford uh, with degrees in law and business. He has previously spoken at Google about investing. From the last time he was here, uh, last summer, he was awarded the Graham and Dodd Murray Greenwald Prize for value investing. He also serves as a charter member of the advisory board of the Healy Brin Center at the Columbia School of Business. Today he will touch upon two very important aspects of his investing. First, the reduction of agency costs. The only thing that comes to mind when people say agency costs is Mr. Warren Buffett's quote. Lethargy bordering on sloth <laughs> remains the cornerstone <laughs> of our investment style. Mr. Russo is an exemplar of the buy and hold strategy and has held many of his positions for decades. Secondly, he will talk about the capacity to reinvest. In doing so, he'll touch upon factors, which form a sort of a checklist for him as he makes his decisions. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Tom Russo. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Speaking here, it reminds me of, of what it must have been like at the catacombs of ancient Rome, where there were um, people sort of who were underground because of the Roman army marching above, and they were they were pursuing their own novel view of the world and the concept that within within the one company in the world that has more information than anywhere else, um, there's a group of people here who believe that information can help you invest wisely as a way uh, um, to add value compared to the um, migration towards passive, the, the passive investors who are the, in fact, Roman army above us. Um, here we sit, we'll talk about why it is that you can hope to make money by investing with a substantial point of view. So um, it's, it's, it's fun to be here. I'm delighted to have been asked to join again. Um, I'm going to really just jump right in um, and, and spend a little time on what I typically spend most of my time talking about, which is which is a three-part process of what it is that I look for in investing, um, because I'd given a bit of the same talk earlier, and, and Sarab thought it might be interesting to, to touch on some other thoughts. So in addition to what we'll go through at the start, um, I've supplemented the comments with um, uh, things I most worry about in the form of a checklist, and then mistakes that I've made. Hopefully, we'll run out of time and I won't get to the mistakes that I've made. Um, but to start off, um, I, I had the great fortune of, of uh, having uh, grown up in the investment business. Um, in, after Dartmouth College, I worked on Wall Street during a period of time when inflation was notorious. It was 1977 to 1979, 1980, and, and interest rates went from 6% to 18%. And you know, you're seared as an investor by what you experience when you're first starting out. Um, that was an extraordinary experience. I suspect those in, in your um, generation who fall prey to Bitcoin may end up seeing uh, similar um, painful moments in the investment business, and you'll learn very good lessons from that. But watching the, um, watching the fixed income markets really writhe during my training um, was, was terrific. I went back to Stanford Business and Law School um, and had the great good fortune at both schools um, to, to have spent time with two legends. Uh, at Stanford Law School, Charles, uh, Charlie Munger was on the board of visitors, and I had a chance to meet with him when I was launching my investing career, and he was very influential. Um, then Warren Buffett came to our uh, value investing seminar, and I think that's really the thing that uh, confirmed for me the approach to investing uh, would be characterized by sloth and lethargy and all of the other sins of inactivity because uh, what they described was an investment process which was very long-term minded. And um, you know, when, when, if you look at the first slide, when I arrived, uh, Warren was really just moving from the world of 50 cent dollar bill investing um, to franchise investments, franchise investing where there is economic goodwill that, uh, that yields a return above what a commodity would. Um, and, and so the 50 cent dollar bill approach that typified early value investors doesn't scale and it's taxable. And the first point Warren made to our class was the government only gives you one break as an investor. That's the, the, um, the uh, uh, tax deferral on unrealized gains. And so if you can find a business 
that has the ability to reinvest its current cash flow into creating greater wealth. Um, and you don't have to sell those shares, you don't have to pay tax. And it's very profound. Most people with very high turnover portfolios just don't get it. Um, so that's the one thing. The second point is, though, if you're going to depend on that reinvestment, then the person who runs the business for you, the actual management, have to be trustworthy. They're your agents, managements, and if they don't represent your interests, then, then the process won't work. Uh, they must be owner-minded. And, uh, and, then, and then the next thing you'll need, uh, if you're going to buy, buy and hold, you have to have a business that has a competitive moat, a business that, that will absorb reinvestment and, and, and return you for it. Um, and, and so, for example, with Berkshire, he started out with, uh, with, a, with a textile mill, and it absorbed a lot of capital, and it destroyed value along the way. And so what you're looking for is a business that has the capacity for reinvestment, and you really start, it has to have a durable, competitive edge. And for me, uh, you know, for some people, that edge is technology. I guess the assembled masses here would, would, would have a technology orientation. For me, it's consumer brands. Um, consumer brands have the uh, great benefit of having the consumer believe there to be uh, no adequate substitute. Uh, once I was at a, at a conference in the spirits industry, and I described why it was that I liked the spirits industry so well, and I said, it's because um, you know if, if somebody offered you a um, a, a, a drink and you and they asked what you wanted if you said a Jack Daniels and they came back and said no we only have Jim Beam the proper answer in the world that I inhabit is no thank you I would I, I would rather have water than 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 what is not my brand that brand loyalty is terrifically important um, uh, and so if you're going to have capacity to reinvest if if you have a brand and you can invest behind expanding that brand into different adjacent categories or geographies. It's extremely valuable. And, um, and for me, my goal is to find global brands because there you have the ability to expand, expand into the parts of the world that themselves should grow. Um, if you think about uh, the, pop, uh, the developing and emerging markets, um, you have population growth, you have consumer disposable income growth, you have GDP growth, you have the growth of infrastructure for distribution. You have all of that ahead of us. Um, and, and that's really the area that, um, for me, welcomes our, our investments. Um, you also have the very interesting factor that the, the, the brands that I typically favor are brands that are kind of left over from the West during a period of time when it was colonial. We own Nestle, we own Unilever, we own Heineken, we own Cadbury. Um, these were products that went around the world, but in a very thin way. Um, they were the products of, of people who lived in countries that um, they controlled, um, but, but they alone could afford, say, um, oh gosh, uh, Nino or uh, uh, Nescafe or, um, or uh, Maggie Soup. Um, those were those were products that the c countries in which we do a lot of business today um, uh, were present. They were advertised, but they were very expensive. They were very uh, inaccessible. Uh, and they were, because of both, um, they've become very aspirational. And, and so um, as markets around the world now begin to prosper, um, that, that the second spouse begins to work, they have a more modern lifestyle, where they reach is to the products that they once aspired to have a chance. And, and, and we tend to then own businesses that have massive amounts of free cash flow from the mature Western markets where it cannot be deployed profitably. But they have the great good fortune of unmet, uh, un, unmet uh, demand in the developing markets. And so the organic reinvestment is so much safer than trying to redeploy your capital into some wholly new product, some wholly new geography. Um, our job is simply to reactivate more deeply. Um, now that requires, um, that to do it right, you need multi, uh, multinational and multilingual management. Um, and, and multicultural, I should say, multilingual and multicultural. Now, for example, um, if I ask this audience here, how many people speak more than one language? Okay. 
This is Google. How many speak more than two? The hands keep going up. Over three? <laughs> okay. So um, it's an extraordinary capacity. Um, it, um, at Kraft Foods, for example, they speak 0.9 languages. Um, in uh, the, um, you know, in Nestle's headquarters, the, the senior management will speak four or five languages. And the ability for that to help them move around the world is extremely valuable, as you all experience here, given your skills. Multicultural, a little more nuanced. For example, in an audience like this in the US, I can usually safely say without any answers coming back to me, who's your favorite cricket player? I think in this audience, I must, have, I must have a high percentage who could answer the question. Well, I mean, that's a big deal. You know, 1.7 billion people will go to bed tonight thinking fond thoughts of just one thing, which is cricket. And as an American trying to travel the world, you know, your effectiveness, it just doesn't have the same impact if you don't have those references and those, those talents. Um, but, but few companies in the world take the reinvestment possibilities and invest the right amount. And that's really because of agency costs. Um, it arises from the, 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 the inability to um, invest the right amount arises in part from the fact that American companies, typically American companies, that's why 70% of my assets are invested in non-US based companies because I think we, we are much more apt to find the talent base, the historic brands, um, in parts of the world uh, uh, through companies that are headquartered in Europe than in the U.S. The U.S. doesn't have the same, um, the same uh, dynastic history and, and they, certainly, um, they certainly suffer from one thing, which is the vast reliance on stock options as compensation. And stock options, unfortunately, uh, deliver one variable to the investment process that shouldn't really necessarily be um, uh, a factor, and that's time. For a stock option to reward you, it has to be worth something on a given day. And so the managements where, whose, whose fortunes depend um, uh, heavily on stock options become very attuned to days. This day, they'll either be worth something or they'll be worthless. And in the process of, 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 of making sure that they can, the shares can be worth as much as humanly possible at any given time, um, managements of, of US-based companies all too often fall prey to Wall Street, who promises them a high valuation if they only agree to make the quarterly earnings every quarter. I was talking to somebody recently um, uh, about this subject, about the need to show quarterly earnings, and he raised his hands and said, um, I used to work for a Silicon Valley-based company. I, I will not name it because I will be um, blackballed. But anyways, a, a Silicon Valley company. And, and they said every, you know, every quarter, about a month left in the quarter, we get the, di the directive, which is um, stop spending money because blank, the head of the company, wants to make his quarterly uh, bonus hurdle, and we need to show, we, we, we need to show profits. Now, you know, when you're in a company, I, hope, I certainly expect that not to be the case here. I don't suspect they take away ping pong balls or bananas or cappuccinos um, as you near quarter, and I hope not, because that would show that the firm's still vigorously on the right path. Um, but when you find that companies gauge their spending off of reported income, which, which Wall Street suggests that if you only make the number, and the number is a reported income number, which is completely fictitious anyways, um, if you make that number, they will recommend your shares. The shares will be worth more because the multiple will apply to this fictitious, not, fict, uh, a fictional number called earnings per share, and you'll have a higher valuation. That game is extraordinarily corrosive for businesses trying to build long-term wealth. Because what you really want to do is just the opposite. Um, so, um, but to, to, to make the investments that are proper, the trouble is, is that when they start out, um, they are extremely burdensome on reported profits. And so um, what you need to have are managements that have the capacity to make the right investments for the very longest term uh, without fear of losing their jobs or without fear of, of takeovers. And because of that, most public companies don't have control over their share registry. And, and if they don't invest 
Um, if they do invest the right amount for the very longest term, they end up at risk in the short term. The loss of their job, the loss of corporate control. And so in our, in our portfolios, um, I was once characterized as an investor by four numbers. Um, one of them is 70% of our holdings are non-US, companies that are headquartered away from the US. 70% um, of the companies are in, um, in the top 10 holdings. We're very, we're very concentrated investors. The top three holdings on behalf of my clients are 30% of the assets. So we're very concentrated. Um, and 65% of our companies are still controlled by the founding families. And what that means is that when, when, when it's right to spend to activate, let's say, Life Boy in India, or it's right to spend to activate more Milo or more um, a Maggie noodle soup, um, uh, they will spend that money assured that if you, if you build a new factory, these factories tend to be very lumpy. In Nestle's case, for example, it costs about $350 million to build a, um, a Maggie factory or a powdered milk factory or a decaffeinated coffee factory. Well, each of those are core pillars to their business. Um, and when, when they build something like that, typically they end up building it when the initially installed capacity is running at overcapacity. And you all understand if you're running at overcapacity, you are overstating profitability because you've more than fully absorbed the fixed, the fixed costs and you're operating at, at efficiency ratios that are not sustainable for the long term. Um, and so ideally, if you're one of our portfolio companies, we want you to pour money into these markets um, to chase after the, the, the initiated demand um, and you have to build a second factory. Well, the, the moment you start down that path, you, you start to um, um, accrue an enormous amount of expenses in and around the process of building. But the real trick is, is that very soon after it's, it switches on, you're going to take the factory that might have been running at 120% of capacity at unsustainable margins, and you're going to bring over half the volume, and both your factories are now running at half capacity. Well, you've just blown a hole through your margins, and, um, and it's not until each of those factories then themselves become fully um, uh, absorbed that you're going to be back in business. Um, however, the fact that the reported profits dropped as they did, um, though bothersome to some, for us, trained under Buffett with the idea of the capacity to suffer through such um, uh, uh, burdens on reported profits, when developing wealth, the wealth, the wealth picks, um, picks up as those businesses come back into full absorption and suddenly you realize that you've met the demand you've created um, and you're ready to build a third factory, let's say, or a fourth. Um, um, in order to survive to that outcome, management has to be protected. And the best way that I've found to help protect management against those, those adverse outcomes is through family control. So whether it's Brown Foreman, which is controlled by the Brown family, who's whose discipline over the years I've owned the shares to roll out Jack Daniels, their core product globally, has richly rewarded us. Um, think of 1986 when we bought the shares. They had collapsed because of a, a mistaken acquisition and they were only left with Jack Daniels, which, which was about a four million case brand per year, making them 300 and some million dollars a year. Um, and they had a 400,000 case Jack Daniels business globally. The family who had lost a considerable amount of their fortune as a result of mismanagement um, dedicated themselves to rolling Jack Daniels out globally with all the expense that it suggested. Um, their earnings would go down substantially as they took their US based Jack Daniels profits and directed that money and the expenses attached to it to developing a taste for Jack Daniels around the world. That was back in 1986. Today, um, they still do 4 million cases in the US. It's gone up in profitability because the cases today are more valuable in the US because consumers have returned to bourbon and they like to have honey or they like to have fire, they like to have all sorts of flavoring and they're making more money off their US business. But the US business did not grow. The value of the investment in, in uh, Brown Foreman uh, arose from the fact that the, um, the global consumer could, could 
be um, uh, romance with the brand and the product and all the rest through heavy investments up front. But once the consumer um, accepts the product, uh, they develop a lifetime value because they'll drink X bottles a year with X margin per person and you can calculate the return on that investment. You can assure yourself that you'll, you'll have uh, nothing but losses up front, but over time uh, you absorb those losses and you're back in business. In the, in the case of Jack Daniels, the 400,000 cases in the, U, in, in the uh, rest of the world today are 13 million cases. And they make about $100 a case, so they've picked up value, uh, earnings of about um, $1.3 billion. At, and it's really only been permitted them because during the period of investment they were allowed, uh, the management who ran the business had the capacity to suffer through um, censure by sell-side analysts who were disappointed that they were no longer making the numbers. And they actually had threats from, from um, uh, outside activists um, to come in and try to dislodge corporate control with family control, which is existing in something like 65% of my portfolio, uh, the families can say to those who, who wish to disrupt, go away. We, we wish to have a profitable um, dynastic future and we don't really care about quarterly or annual earnings. That's an extremely valuable pond in which we fish. Um, so the um, capacity to suffer concept was, was sort of first delivered to me through Berkshire. And if you take a look, um, uh, well, I think we've pretty much gone over that. But take a look at Berkshire. There are a couple of examples there which are so, so instructive. In Geico's case, they bought Geico and only had a million policyholders. Um, a a policyholder at, at Geico is worth $2,000. That's the net present value of all of their future streams of earnings. And they, it's a very high number because there's high persistency at GEICO. Very few people um, cancel. And so if you have a client, uh, an insured, they're worth $2,000. And when they bought the business, they only a million of them. So the business is worth $2 billion plus or minus. Um, the trouble is when you bring on stream a new, a new insured, the first year they have a loss of $250 per insured. Um, they make $150 annually off of an insured, but bringing one on board loses them $250. So if you think about the math, when Warren bought the business, they had a million policyholders earning $150. That's $150 million of profit. Okay. So if the next year they wanted to grow the business by a million policyholders, look what happens to reported profits. It goes to minus $100 million. The, the 150 that they were earning suddenly gets overwhelmed by the 250 million that attaches to the million new uh, insured. Now Warren bought the business, they only had a million insured. Now 14 years later, he said in his annual report that Geico, for all of those who are, are his partners and want to understand what it is that they own, because Warren um, has said that he would like to always buy shares of Berkshire at the right price. Berkshire would love to repurchase its shares. The trouble is um, that um, uh, Warren doesn't want to buy from someone who's uninformed about its worth. So periodically he gives us through the annual uh, report gems like he did three years ago and he said, and by the way, um, um, Geico is worth $20 billion more than what we paid for it. And the reason was is that since he, he, he acquired it, um, at the cost of income, he started to push hard. He took his advertising from 30 million to 900 million a year. You know that because every, car, every commercial on television is a caveman or a, or a gecko or something else. Um, he grew the um, insured base now to over 11 and a half million. No, I'm sorry, excuse me, it's at 13 million today. Um, and, uh, and so he's added a, 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 um, 11 million, 12 million policyholders times $2,000 per person. That's $24 billion today. What's very interesting is this year, because there are lots of catastrophes all over, all over the country, weather related, um, Berkshire's competitors, their dire sort of life battle 
competitors decided not to uh, renew business this year and not to go after new business because they were showing losses in other businesses and they wanted to report numbers that satisfied the sell side who had expectations about what, what um, they should do. Um, in the environment where the losses elsewhere were so grave, they backed away. Warren picked up a million and a half policyholders this year because he has no, he has no care whatsoever about his reported profits. Now, he's fortunate because he controls 40% of the company and other people friendly to him control the rest. Nobody's going to take over Berkshire if they underreport profits in Geico because they've taken on the business that their competitors um, forewent because they had to show numbers differently than Berkshire. Berkshire's created the world that it occupies by, um, by, by um, focusing only on value and not reported profits. Anyone else could do it, but it takes, it takes the kind of um, discipline, and, and Berkshire thrives on that. Another example, equity index put options. This is an interesting one. When um, 2000, let's take a look here. Um, oh yeah, this is, this is it. If you look here, it's very hard to read. Anyways, Berkshire some, some 10, 15 years back had the opportunity to, to receive from an insurance con conglomerate $5 billion of premium um, with the obligation that he th would make good any decline in the value of that portfolio from $37 billion to any number below um, for $5 billion in cash, which they gave Berkshire. Berkshire pledged to make them whole, whatever the decline took. Um, now, um, nobody else would could make a pledge that the insured, the person seeking insurance, would actually trust. Because few would keep enough liquidity around that if the markets really did melt down to zero, that they could actually be good for the money. Well, Berkshire has $110 billion of cash on the balance sheet and has kept a huge cash hoard the entire time. So the insured paid him $5 billion, which is way too much money in part because he alone will have the money to make good on the commitment if it happened that the equity markets went to zero globally. Um, he also was paid far too much money because no other insurance company want, would bid the business. Because once they've established that they, um, that they have an obligation to make whole anything below $37 billion, they face mark to market. And what that means, mark to market, means that if equity markets around the world declined, um, he would have to, he'd have to pass the amount of his obligations increase through the income statement. And so, I bet this has a little red button here. I could probably point to it. Anyways, um, if you look at something like 2008, you'll see in one of the years he passed through his income statement a $6 billion quote unquote loss. It really isn't a loss. He had, he had 10 or 15 years yet before the contract matured, it was just a valuation mark. Um, no other insurance company publicly held could withstand that type of a, a markdown based on mark to market. And so I think Berkshire succeeded in that investment largely because um, they did not have um, competitors willing to take, that, take on the same risk. Um, let me go back a second here. All right, Berkshire, okay, let's, let's take a look. Okay, well, we're gonna move on to the, the, second, the second topic, which is what are the things I really do focus on? And obviously the number, in, in some ways, the factors I most fear are businesses which fail in the areas that I most esteem in Berkshire. And so the start would be agency costs. And, and I can assure you that probably 90% of the investments I look at, I just pass on because I just don't trust that the people who run the business will have our interests at heart and make investments for the longest term. And, and one of the examples I'd say is um, if, if, if a business is focused on the near term, they'll, they'll either do one of two things. They'll either um, uh, fear saying no to Wall Street when the right answer is yes. Or they'll fear saying no to Wall Street, or saying yes to Wall Street when the right answer is no. And I'll give you an example of this, and it's sort of an interesting one on many levels, but it has to do with Heineken. 
I first bought Heineken in 1986. It was a mature Western market. 25% um, of the profitability of Heineken was from the United States. Um, and uh, and um, they had no, experience, no exposure in developing emerging markets. Um, today they have 75% of their business in developing emerging markets. 5% of the profits comes from the U.S. And the two most profitable markets are, are Mexico first and in Vietnam second. So the business has completely transformed itself by virtue of their willingness to suffer through the burden on investment along the way for the past 25 years since I've held the stock. Well, a couple of years ago, they had a chance to buy a Brazilian brewer, which would have doubled their size. They have a 12% market share. This business had 16%. And AB InBev, Budweiser's parent company, um, had the rest. Wall Street clamored for them to buy that business because it would give them extra scale in that market. Um, problem was price. It was a $5 billion acquisition. Wall Street clamored on them to say, yes, do it. Heineken ran the numbers and said, no, walked away. Four years later, um, the, the buyer, Kieran, came back to the market and said, not a good business, not suitable for us. We'd like to sell it. Wall Street, having watched it underperform for that period of time, said, absolutely, don't even go close to it. No, don't even think about buying that business. Heineken took a look at it and thought, looked pretty interesting. They bought it for $720 million. Now, you can make a lot of money buying something for $720 instead of $5 billion. Um, and, and Wall Street, you know, and, and Heineken is... 51% controlled in the share price in, in share holdings by the family. So when first pressured to buy it for five billion, the family said, no, it's, it's stupid, it doesn't make any sense. At 720, when they were when they were threatened if they bought it, that they'd be downgraded by every analyst, who cares? It's 720 million dollars for 18, 16% of the market. Um, the, the real trick was that having bought it at 720, they now recognize they have a billion dollars that will be passed through the income statement, putting it together. They have to move factories or breweries around. They have, to, they have to redo their distribution agreements. They're going to be spending a tremendous amount of money, and that's going to burden the income statement for the, for the foreseeable future. And that burden is what Wall Street really hates. And that's why um, they recommended uh, around the news of this event that, 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 uh, that they've, they've gone mad, they're entering in the market that cost somebody else $3 billion, $4 billion, and the share price weakened. Along came another company called SAB Miller, South African Breweries Miller Beer, and, and they were being pursued by Budweiser. And of course, what do they do? But they lob a takeover offer to buy Heineken because the shares had gone down, the market was disappointed, they, they bought the Brazilians. They sent a letter to Heineken saying, we'd like to take you over for a very high price. And Heineken said, no thanks, goodbye. They have 50.1% of the vote and they don't have to worry about Wall Street's pressure. Now, in this context, they've already become as profitable and as large as they have because of their capacity to suffer through the upfront cost of their investments. But this episode, they said no when Wall Street clamored yes. They said yes when Wall Street said no. And then as a result of that, the bad, the bad reception meant the shares went down. They were offered a takeover, which they said no. And we, we will continue to hold the shares. We've, I've held them since 1986. And I think that's a, it's a pretty good example of how that works. Um, so let's jump on to the section that is um, what I most worry about. Here we go. Ah, factors I most fear. The first one is, is uh, the first and only, really, is agency costs. Huh. Have we lost it? Yeah, there it is. And you know, the list is, is, is enormous of the businesses that I've owned that have suffered, and we've actually sold them because of agency costs. Citibank, um, at one point, um, had a business whereby they would, underwrite, um, they would underwrite bonds even if the market had no interest in them. And, um, and they put them in something called a side pocket, SIV. And, and in a sense, the bankers were issuing debt on behalf of businesses which um, had no buyers. And, and so they created a vehicle alongside the balance sheet of, of Citibank 
uh, in which um, uh, they would park these unsold bonds. At the end of the year, the management would get their bonuses for having produced the bonds. And at some point, off balance sheet, they sat festering uh, and a burden ultimately on Citibank. And when I was described that condition, I sold the shares immediately. Um, Citibank turned out to be a, a complete disaster thereafter. It, it dropped by 98% um, since we sold those shares. And, um, and it was a complete disaster, but for one thing for us personally, is that through it we met a man named A.J. Banga, who's the, chair, who's the CEO of, of, of MasterCard. And, and we bought MasterCard um, soon thereafter for $20 a share. It's now $170. It's been the best investment that we've probably made, and, and the investment really was based on the character and caliber of this business leader who is exceptional and unrivaled. Um, we did not buy um, uh, MasterCard at the first iteration, but it was a, it was a, um, a tremendous dividend that came as a result of our, our activities there. Um, International Speedway is a business that we owned, um, and uh, the, a family, called the France family, owned the NASCAR franchise. And International Speedway was a public vehicle which owned tracks. And just like Coca-Cola has a conflict with its bottlers um, to, to have the bottlers spend more money uh, so Coke, the brand, could become more valuable, in this case, uh, International Speedway embarked upon a, a shareholder-driven um, mandate to build more tracks around the country. NASCAR is a great business. You know, it, it's basically a um, branding opportunity for um, companies that want to reach the middle America. And um, it was regionally defined historically. And, um, and they, they went on a, a hunt for new locations and they built seven more uh, places. Ultimately, they threatened the franchise because of oversaturation. And at the end of it all, they were trying to build for $500 million a racetrack in um, uh, Staten Island over a waste dump. And of course, a completely ridiculous extension at that point, um, benefiting the family because they get more revenue because of more, more sites, but destroying value all along at, um, at the company, International Speedway. Uh, that was a misalignment of interest, and you can see those. Um. Second thing I fear the most is lack of natural reinvestment. As I said, the businesses that we own have a very natural reinvestment, which is they just go back to the markets where they've long standardly existed and invest to build distribution, marketing, brand awareness, and all the rest. Um, so, you know, we own Wells Fargo. It's a domestic business. Um, at some point, we will sell it because it doesn't really have the reinvestment um, opportunities. We call that opportunity white space. And, and uh, to give you an order of magnitude, we own uh, uh, several brewers. In Africa, the, the, um, there's 400 million barrels of beer consumed a year, and the businesses that we collectively own only manufacture 100, mil 100 million of those barrels. There's 300 million barrels that are available as a natural re uh, op opportunity to reinvest. Um, uh, what I fear most is the understanding that some companies don't know um, what is enough. Berkshire's excellent at that um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and made us a tremendous amount of money knowing that a certain investment um, is very, very uh, valuable and not to reach for something that's beyond, uh, beyond the um, uh, realization potential. So, for example, in the one I'm thinking of with Berkshire, understanding what is enough, in the midst of the, the, the financial crisis of 2010, they issued a $6 billion preferred to, um, or they bought a $6 billion preferred from Bank of America. This is 6%. They were only making half a percent on their cash. It's a big improvement off the cash. But really what they got from it was um, in return for their goodwill that's conferred upon them by virtue of their uh, credit review of, of Bank of America, it was valuable enough that Bank of America gave Berkshire 700 million call options at $7 a share, which was the then market price that lasted for 10 years. That, that has made Berkshire $22 billion. So, a modest looking preferred, 6%, um, it's beneficial for them because there's a tax shield by dividends, but still modest. Um, 
with that warrant attached, be, turn six billion dollars into 28. It's extraordinary. Now, um, you know, other people at the same time reach in, in for, for yield, but if you reach for yield um, and it's too high, chances are you'll, you'll get what, what the yield suggests, which is more risk than you care for. Um, anyway, so the, by far and away, the next uh, factor I fear is, is corruption. And I'll give you a couple of fun examples. Um, in Richemont, um, most of Richemont's competitors, luxury goods company, most of their competitors in Russia did business with a facilitator. And the, the facilitator was really the Chechnyan mob. And, and the way that works is, you know, they'll get you into anything up front, but then they're your silent partner for the rest of your time. And Richemont has enough money that they don't need a silent partner. They were shown a building. There's a twin building on the main uh, boulevard for shopping for luxury. And they were shown one that they could move into immediately for a $500,000 a year rent. The next door was the same building, kind of in poor repair. Um, the one that they could go into was fully repaired. Um, the one that they, they, the next door one, they bought for $25 million. Instead of taking a half a million dollar a year lease for the whole building, they paid $25 million for the building that they bought. They wanted independence and it had an upfront cost. They did nothing but lose money. Um, but over time, they own their future. The people who take the early bait come in to get active quickly in that market, rue the fact that they ever met the group because for the rest of time they'll take more and more and more money. They're just the mob. And, uh, and uh, Richemont not caring about near-term income because it's controlled by the Rupert family and they want wealth, not reported profits, um, paid way over the top, but they bought certainty. Um, I visited Heineken in St. Petersburg um, and they had a factory uh, that um, they, uh, this corruption, um, that they had to um, hire a local mob for security, quote, unquote, because it's very hard under IFRS to stash bribes in an income statement. So you, they, you figure out something like security. So they had, they had hired this group to deliver, you know, 50 people walking around with machine guns in this warehouse full of beer that they just brewed. Um, and then there's a, they all wore brown shirts, and inside there were a group of people with machine guns who had white shirts. And I said, why are the white shirt uh, people with machine guns? And I said, well, those are the people we hire to protect against the mob who we have to pay. Um, this is a difficult way to do business, and um, unfortunately, it's all too common. We still hold Heineken despite that, but it gives you a sense of what we're, what we're attuned to, at least. Um, agency costs, you know the story there. Excise tax, um, it's very interesting. Our businesses have, a, um, have a, a, a price inelastic demand. That means that governments understand that they can raise the price on our products and the consumers will keep consuming. Whether it's cigarettes, beer, or spirits, um, that's the case. Um, uh, however, around the world, there's a new product, which is this thing here, um, which Philip Morris has invented, which is a, um, it's a heat not burn uh, cigarette replacement. They developed this over the past four years. They spent two and a half billion dollars developing this, destroying their reported profits for two and a half years. But they realized that if they didn't transition from traditional cigarettes to the next generation, someone else would. And so they invested to destroy their own business ultimately, came up with this thing. Um, since they've launched it, five million Japanese have converted fully to this product and they've given up um, combusted cigarettes. So it's a very big deal. And, um, and when they launch throughout the world, um, they're given a big discount in excise taxes. And that, that excise tax discount is what helps underwrite the cost of developing this product and sending it worldwide. But um, so taxes are usually um, confiscatory and, 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 uh, and, 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 and drive away pricing pop uh, elasticity. But in some instances, they will adopt something like this product with an idea towards helping the, uh, the society. Um, so we just go on regulation. You know, you see it all over uh, the world. In, in, in India, um, you cannot import spirits. Um, uh, the, if there's one thing that in India is, uh, is, is a bankable um, outcome, um, it is uh, their passion for scotch, whiskey. Uh, as a broad statement. And let me ask here, of any Indians here, what is it that 
that would be most likely to travel home through duty free with an Indian. <laughs> it's one thing. You all have the same idea. I, I, it's Johnny Walker Black Label, two bottles. And it's Black Label. That's, that's just it. Um, the Indians drink 125 million cases of, of Scotch-like products. Um, but the tariff barriers are so horrific that you can't really bring in Scotch. I mean, that's why it's a duty-free thing. Um, uh, Scotland produces 75 million barrels a year. Um, and, and we own three, we own four Scotch producers. And we believe that over time that regulation, because of WTO and all of the other um, forces that open up markets that want to th themselves be open uh, to trade elsewhere, that we will see a world where um, Indians will get really what they prefer, which is a high quality um, imported heritage a beverage and and the the target market there's 125 million cases and so um regulation prevents it now um, in india we own we own the shares of united brewery we own 50 percent of united brewery through heineken um it's very hard to get economics right for breweries because you have to have a brewery in each province and obviously breweries scale at a much different level than the provincial demand and there are only 13,000 legal outlets for beer in india 1.4 billion people. They, um, and so um, all of those forces uh, that relate to regulation will over time um, open up and I think lead to our, our business's success. Um, we talked about taxation. We have, uh, uh, it's a very funny one, different cultural references. Um, Chinese company came about maybe eight years ago. Um, created by two, two uh, uh, people who had uh, studied and trained in the US. Um, I met with them. They, they sold par uh, leaf and paper for the cigarette industry. Um, they went public. I met with them. They spoke perfect English. They knew everything about accounting, all the rest. And I thought, that's amazing, because for 25 years, I've met with the management, senior management, of Japan Tobacco, the third largest tobacco company in the world. Um, I, we still talk to them through interpreters. 25 years later, they still, there's a fiction of interpreters, um, you know, when, when um, it, it, and it really makes a big difference in terms of your ability to understand. I visited Korea and, and met with the management from Latte Confectionery. And I, to give you an example of how cultural differences can play against you, I asked the interpreter, to ask the CFO who we were with, what the future cash flow looked like for the next and coming years. And they spoke um, Korean together for about 40 minutes. And the answer came back, better. <laughs> the answer came back, you know, better. OK, I can't invest on that. Um, and the last example, and again, it's, it's just a, a story, but it's, a, it's true and fun. Um, I went to see Asahi beer. And, and I spoke through an interpreter for four hours, just like that. And you know, same kind of cl um, conclusionary answers came back. And we finished a miserable experience. And afterwards, we swapped business cards. And, and the man who received the card said, oh, you're from, Her you're from Lancaster. I grew up in Reading. Now, he's in Japan. He's, he's the director of investor relations for Asahi beer, Japanese beer. But he spent eight years of his life as a teenager living 20 minutes from where our offices are in Pennsylvania. And he spent four hours of my life torturing me with a, with a, with a um, translator, uh, only to finish up by saying, oh, I, I grew up in Lancaster. You're in Reading. And so um, you, that's something that I fear the most, is the inability to get information. Um, and then a quick look at some mistakes. Um, newspapers, I, I lost a lot of money on newspapers. Um, they just completely missed you guys. <laughs> um, you know, newspapers co-opted radio when it first came about. They co-opted television stations. They understood that they needed to buy up cable business. They did everything related to media and entertainment and advertising um, to keep the power and the franchise within their own industry. And along came um, eBay and uh, Amazon early days, and they went straight to newspapers and said, let's partner, you've got the market, we've got the, we've got the next gen, let's do it together, you know, perfect. And the newspapers had become so monopolistic, fat and, and lethargic and slothful that they said, no, we want to keep it ourselves. 
but they had they just they just blinked in this case and and we sold all of our newspapers and it was it was a, a disappointment um, these are mistakes of commission I actually own those um, and Mistakes of omission are interesting. MasterCard at the IPO, we did not buy it. Um, uh, they lacked a dynamic leader. AJ Banga came along later on. Uh, it, it went up fivefold after the IPO. We did not own it. Then it dropped 80% back to something close to the start, and we, we bought it the second time around, but only because of the quality of the CEO who came in, um, who's one of the most masterful uh, leaders in business. Uh, he's Indian. He started, uh, would, um, excelled at the finest school and is extraordinary talented. Um, I omitted to buy Mao Tai. I saw someone, are you from China? China. So Mao Tai. Um, the shares collapsed five years ago when, when Xi uh, went after um, banqueting and luxury and, and, and his attempt to get rid of corruption. The shares collapsed and have, have advanced eightfold over the past four years. And the market value of Mountai might be $400 billion. They make 70, what is the, what's the number? They make seven billion or some number that's just unfathomable. It's a brand that I didn't buy because I assumed at some point that as China became a more open um, nation with more people traveling around the world, they would surely leave that product, which no one can drink. Um, outside of China and, and, and aspire to the things that the rest of the world like, and it hasn't happened. And they've made an extraordinary fortune. Um, and, and the other thing is it was controlled by the Communist Party and the army, and I just felt like that would be a fairly high level of agency costs. I passed Alibaba at the IPO agency costs. I mean, what could be more strong than to know that Alibaba's Jack Ma already took $6 billion um, illicitly from Yahoo uh, through Alipay? So that seemed like it was probably a strike against them, but it's done extremely well. And Google, you know, I haven't, I haven't um, purchased their shares, even though I'm extraordinarily impressed with their ability to recruit the best and the brightest, you included. Uh, and um, and the, um, the, the, the notion of allowing, allowing those here to share and participate um, in developing products without a lot of ownership amongst age groups or, or divisions. So it's an extraordinary company. I take my hat off to you. I should have bought the shares a long time ago, but I'll stay open-minded on them. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think I'm gonna call that, call that, oh no, I have, a, I have something um, uh, at the end here. Let's go back quickly. I'll share with you a couple of the things that I, I think about as I reflect over investments, courtesy of these two gentlemen. Um, so you can look at Charlie Munger's uh, musings. Invert, invert, invert. It's, I, I suspect most of you know all of these points because you're, you're um, students of investing. But that invert is very similar to what Warren said, where he said, if something's not worth doing at all, don't do it. Invert means go to where you want to end up and then reason backwards the most efficient way to get there and just don't go to the other places along the way that tie up most people's bother. Um, figure it out and then work back from the outcome you desire. Um, Warren, uh, Charlie talked once about, uh, this is very profound, uh, they owned 7% of Freddie Mac, which was the largest uh, mortgage insurance company, government sponsored entity. and. Um, and I was at the annual meeting for Charlie's company, and someone said, why did you sell it? Because a guy who was actually quite a whiner, he was, he was whining at Charlie Munger, saying the stock was at 47 when you sold it. It's now 70. Why did you sell that? And should we think about replacing you as the uh, investment officer? And Charlie was a bit peeved. And he looked out at this guy, waited for a long time, and he said, and to response to the question, why did you sell it? He said, because we felt like it. Simple as that. It's such a powerful answer. Um, it turns out that there were reasons. They had, they had um, put junk bonds in their portfolio. They had extend, they retained mortgages instead of just securitizing them. And, uh, and um, they were going uh, into subprime to sort of generate unnatural reinvestment when they should have been patient. Anyways, um, all those were going on. But he basically said, um, you know, we spent all of our lifetime trying to figure out um, uh, uh, businesses. And, and when you have a response based on your, on your judgment that, ref that you can't actually put your finger on, um, you're still supposed to act on it. 
Most people overly value knowledge, thinking that it is, um, uh, it is uh, the, the trump card when beliefs, well informed, um, are, are really what you have to act on. And, and what basically Charlie said is they felt uncomfortable, um, some reason, but just a general development, and so they sold $7 billion worth of a stock. Now, most people would be fired if they operated with, with, with what seems so thin as a, as a reason, but you spend your life developing judgment, um, and then failure to act on it because you're still waiting for more information um, is dangerous. The world is full of an 80-20 rule, and in many instances, 80% is enough. Um, it, it certainly, um, so that's one. Uh, it, Warren and Charlie were asked uh, this year at the meeting uh, why they didn't do something that was quite dangerous to their capital, and they said basically it's because they want to be um, rational, not brilliant. Another firm in the insurance business did something that cost them $3 billion, Warren didn't, and, and the reason was that the other firm was looking for something that would be brilliant, and Warren and uh, Charlie passed because they just needed the very simple uh, test of being um, irrational. I, I think I'm going to stop. Um, um, Saroob asked me to give one last thing, which is um, my own lessons learned. Um, and the, I say that the first one is compound interest, um, and that's a career story. You, you'll start your career out now, um, and 20 years from now, it'll depend on those little steps that you take well that over time add up to big results. Um, and you'll see people in business early on who take big steps early on, and you should know that along the way they'll probably fall along the side uh, and, and, and staying the course and building a platform that's very um, uh, cumulative is, 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 is uh, good. Um, uh, character, you know, Buffett says it, I think it's true. Reputation takes a lifetime to build and you can destroy it in a minute. So, I mean, that's, that's clear. And he also says how many people he finds in his life who spend a lifetime sort of gaining wealth and, and do so at the risk of the reputation, which at the end when they're rich, the only thing they care about is the reputation. So just, just make sure that you recognize that if you give it up, you're not going to get it back very easily. Um, capacity to do nothing is vastly, um, uh, vastly uh, underappreciated. But sloth and lethargy, as they say at Berkshire, but for me, just just not not acting as often as most. I turn over, I have a slide I didn't show you. Last year, our portfolio turnover was 1.8%. 1 1.8%. 1 um, and then uh, my business school professor who sort of sent me down this journey of, of, uh, of value investing globally um, said everybody should make sure that you have a folly, something that makes no sense, that just adds enjoyment pure, and, um, and that can't be justified. Um, th those are some things I leave you with. Those are those are from you know, courtesy of what what you learn as you go along. There's a little time left for questions. I I hope you have some. And I'm sorry if I ran late. Yep. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. So I'd love to hear Tom more about the uh, five C's and maybe if we could just uh, start with the last one. What is a folly of yours? Yeah. I'd say art, probably. My wife and I both like art. Um, we, we, we like art by artists who we know. We're not, uh, we don't participate. Um, you know, I think, I think in art, um, there's, a, there's a component that's, that's, that's just inspirational, and, and we stay within that rather than enter the world of commercial art, which is what um, draws many people to it. Anyways, it, it, that would be one thing that's quite... Um, uh, of interest to us, and, and I, I'd say certainly a folly is my tennis game, um, <laughs> because the prospects of it adding much value over time is quite low. But I, I'm still quite interested. So those are the two. And and Tom, uh, I remember when speaking over the phone, you also said uh, about the importance of character. Yeah. And uh, how even more than let's say talent and intellect. Yeah. You consider character and culture to be key. Yeah. Uh, was wondering, you know, in terms of life experiences that you draw from, inspirations that you draw yeah. from, if you could talk to us a little bit more, especially because uh, not only here, but a lot of people on the video are going to be 
youngsters who yeah. are looking at your talk for inspiration, so, so that yeah. would appeal to them. Well, I, all I can say is when you get cultures right, um, they, have a, they have an extraordinary benefit. Um, and Nestle would be the, the place where I learned this. Um, and, um, you know, it was, um, it was a business that just had a shared vision and, uh, and w had the ability to align decisions along what, um, what uh, was asked of them as a culture, um, uh, as well as the economic promise of it. Um, I suspect that that culture here is, a, is extraordinary. And as I said, I was here five years ago when I first spoke, um, and I was with a group um, after the presentation, and a very young person who found his way, as so many do here, um, with enormous talent, um, provided an answer to a question of a person in his mid to late 40s who just who suggested he was uh, stumped. And this very young person said, have you considered the following? And you know, I, it was, the room was silent. There were sort of 12 people in the room. I thought, oh, this kid's going to get his you know, legs chopped off. Um, and the older guy said, uh, no, but it's a great idea. And so he said that in front of all of us, a recognizing that he didn't have that insight, this guy did. He was half his age, and he felt perfectly comfortable applauding that as a possible source of a solution. It's a very valuable cultural thing. It does not exist in most companies. Most companies are terribly territorial over, over ideas, um, very loath to shed praise broadly and really low to, to extend a hand to someone else. I mean, this is an extraordinary um, character of, of, and one that I would hope is preservable. Um, so that's a, a plug for yourselves, but it's an important one. And, and on compound interest, I remember you'd, you'd said to me something along the lines of the returns being so back-ended yeah. that for the first maybe decade or two of your career, yeah. uh, you didn't get a lot of recognition. I mean, right. stuff that just comes to you. Know, maybe if you could talk to us a little bit about that, people might find that inspiring as well. No, I, I must say, I was at the hotel this morning. I came upon this. Well, that's sort of interesting. He was a classmate of mine at business school. And he didn't start out owning the Warriors, but he ended up owning the Warriors. And, and, and he's interviewed in here, and he said, you know, he, when he was eight or nine, he, he came upon the first indoor basketball court he ever had, and he said, someday may own it, but he started out in business, and it was just like this. But, you know, um, with, with the right direction um, and, and, and a couple of good breaks and character that, that, uh, that, that protected him from you know, overreaching too soon, um, he ends up with his dream. Um, and I, th I thought that was quite, quite telling, um, and uh, I, was, I was impressed to see it. Um, but I think, you know, I think uh, the remarkable uh, uh, notion is that it, a series of small things add up over time and, and, and can, can, can richly reward. Was that your experience too? Absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, I was with some investors recently who had, um, over the past decade, extraordinarily um, uh, 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 sort of um, visible and dynamic and, and, and uh, you know, active businesses. And they've all, at some level or other, sort of shut them down or restricted them, moved them back. And he said, what, what, what's the difference? How can you still be doing this? And you don't even do anything. <laughs> you, know, you don't buy stocks. You, you hold companies for a long time. And I, I sort of gave the same answer. It was just, you know, by just staying to the same thing, um, uh, we've been able to, um, uh, I think, find some interesting businesses that, because of their own culture and character, have been able to um, redeploy capital internally without worrying about quarterly numbers. Uh, that's allowed it to stretch out and deliver value over time. But you'll see a handful of businesses like that. Uh, yes? Um, is age of a business a factor into when you decide to invest in something? Because there's all this talk about getting into things early and yeah. then it's a very scary aspect to start off with because a lot of things just be end up being like Wall Street gimmicks or yes and and so is age a factor into when you look at a investable business so for me I oversee about 14 billion dollars and so I don't really have the luxury of deploying that into businesses that are really young other than you and Amazon. I mean, there's, a, there's this extraordinary phenomenon right now, 
where dynamic new businesses are also enjoying extraordinary high valuations. So I have the I have the liquidity and the right to invest in these new businesses, and and haven't yet. Um, uh, I'm I'm impressed, um, and I and I see within them something more than what I have been. Uh, led to believe up until recently, which is, oh, well, these are mere, mere technology businesses. It's, it's just much more disruptive, more deeply disruptive. Um, um, but size usually would keep me out of new companies. But that's no, that's no justification here because your, your caps are so large. You know, I think the four leading members of FANGS have a market capitalization. So do you have a $2 trillion or something? More than $2 trillion, so I, there's plenty for me to find. Um, so also new, you know, they don't have the, 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 the um, new, is, new is the kind of destroyer of, of uh, the threatened destroyer of our businesses in many instances. Think about Jack Daniels and suddenly you have Bullet and you have Hudson Whiskin and the more the more difficult the search of discovery is for something that's new and new, um, the, more, the more it's rewarded today. And so across all of our investments, we actually are engaged in mortal warfare against the new, while at the same time trying to reinterpret that which made those businesses which we rely upon once great. Um, will allow them to continue to stay great. So they have to become new in themselves, and that's what this thing was all about. Here's a tobacco company, which is the most profitable tobacco company in the world, coming up with a product that's destined to, to eliminate the business which they've relied upon for so long. One of the musings that Charlie Munger has, which I think is so profound about Berkshire Hathaway, is he said, um, he said uh, at some point, um, that which made us great at Berkshire is most likely not to be that which will keep us great or allow us to become more great. I actually don't have it up there. But um, I no, I see it's that which made Berkshire great. It's right in the middle. And um, you know, he's, he's 94 and understands that if you don't um, modify what, what, what's gotten you um, well served to date, you, you run the risk of, of, uh, of, of missing the next turn. We've run over. Yes, do you have a question? <clears throat> you said you did not have a very good experience in the newspaper industry, right? Yes. So w what are your learnings uh, from that experience and like, uh, how do you suggest us to evaluate media companies? Yeah. Um, you know, it really is just you know, an excessive amount of contentedness that the industry fell into when they finally had all basically merged into single newspaper towns. And they, they um, you know, I, I have a funny view on this. Um, I sort of, I sort of um, take it back to almost the um, time of Watergate when newspapers um, played such an important role. The Washington Post played such an important role in breaking open a political scandal. Um, uh, that that the role of newspapers at that at that moment sort of changed, and they they really um, uh, they really uh, took a um, a turn towards sort of trying to find the next story, the next story along those big headline grabbing ways. And the best newspapers, the ones that really make money and that are really part of the community, are those which are focused intensely on local, and and so. Um, they'd have seven pictures of the high school football team you know, engaged on uh, they have stories about um, who was arrested, who was married, who died. Um, it's the stuff of the communities that really create, um, but, um, but the, um, the lure of, of Pulitzer Prize winning kind of uh, expose journalism became sort of hypercharged after Watergate, and I think that that shriveled, they sort of shred the the intimate relationship that a paper had with its town, and and the papers that still exist are those that and they that they still make some money, but they're they're a lot thinner and they um, and they focus on on, on the area now, um, advertising as you as you better than anyone else would know, um, 
is, is becoming a really a fascinating story of, of sort of personal testimonials and a personal search for um, something that you can friend and then tell others about. Um, and, you know, that is very interesting because you know, newspapers, as they were um, historically set up as advertising vehicles, you know, the advertising um, paid for the uh, content and, and the content is what drew the eyeballs that, that advertisers cared about. Today, you know, the advertising is very specific, very purposeful. Um, and so the ancillary advertising that arose from just the uh, presence of having content that you wanted to see and you accidentally saw an advertising next to it is, is very old fashioned. Advertising today is placed with a purpose and it's often itself, you know, it's not, it's not collateral. And, uh, and it accordingly is, has, it's becoming far more effective because they, you know, the idea is that um, uh, information informs that, um, that you are about to buy a red sweater because of all of the prior steps you've taken. And, and you know, the guy who sells red sweaters wants to know about that on time. And so that's a very different world and it's very powerful. Uh, and with that, I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Russo. Thank you. My pleasure.